Welcome everyone on a much better Friday. And I have a couple of announcements. One is cell phones, off please. Second, wait for the microphone during the question and answer period. I said cell phone. Um, the other thing you need to know is that handsome gentleman there is from channel 17 and eventually you'll be able to watch the whole lecture again. Now, our um, EEE board is usually um, extremely brilliant and right on the money, but this time we've made a little mistake. If you notice on Friday, April 6th, it says we're gonna have coffee. However, the lecture is in the sanctuary. Uh-uh, no coffee allowed. The coffee will therefore be on the previous Friday on March 23rd. Yeah, the 23rd. So, the other thing I have to tell you is remember that we are planning a trip on May 9th and sign up two weeks, yes, the 23rd. Uh, two we, uh, the trip to um, Barrie is in, in May and the sign up sheet is in the back. And the other thing I want to remind you all of is that every week, Peter, our genius here, tapes the lectures and the questions that you ask and the answers, which is why you gotta have a microphone. And he makes um, copies and they are available to borrow. You need to go back and sign up, take the CD, go home, play it, then bring it back. We have, um, CDs going back to 2007. So, and they're all arranged by either the whoever gave the lecture or the date. So, it is a wonderful benefit. And of course, because I'm standing here before you, we would like a volunteer to carry on that work. And um, Kathy has done it for many years, and she's an expert at it, would be happy to train you. But she's ready to retire. So we hope that that benefit will continue. And now Beth will introduce our speaker. Thank you. I'm very happy today to welcome Paul Yoon. Paul earned his bachelor's in philosophy and his master's in education from Boston College. He also holds a master's from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. For the past five years, he's been the assistant principal at the Frederick Tuttle Middle School in South Burlington. He also is a partner in a local consulting firm that helps organizations uh, achieve greater proficiency culturally. And just this week, Paul began a new position in a different place, and so we're very fortunate that he's with us still today. Um, he is now the Senior Advisor for Strategic Diversity Assessment and Research at the University of Vermont. <laughs> And if you've been following the news, you know that diversity issues are front and center at UVM, as they have been in the community and in the nation. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome Paul Yoon. Thank you very much, Beth. It is an honor to be here, and I do want to just acknowledge, first and foremost, that um, having been at UVM now for the past five days, I think I might have caught a little bit of a cold, and so um, my voice today is particularly baritone, and I hope that actually that is good, especially for those of you who choose to listen to this uh, again at another time. My mother has joked with me throughout my life that I should become a radio personality, and so uh, again, I hope that my voice is accessible. I also want to make sure, with Peter's help, that everybody here in this room can hear me. So if there is a time where you feel like we need to turn up the volume, or if you can't hear me for whatever reason, please just let us know. I think a simple hand and arm gesture would be sufficient, or again, trying to get one of our attentions as well. Right? So as Beth said, um, it is again um, great to be actually back here in South Burlington. 
as I drove down Dorset Street just a few minutes ago and past the Frederick H. Tuttle Middle School. I was thinking about how much has changed just over the past seven days, at least for me. Uh, it is great to be back here to do this. Beth and I actually met uh, just a few months ago in South Burlington when I was moderating a discussion on uh, the yearly kind of reading of Frederick Douglass's what is the 4th of July to the American Negro? And that was a great event that I encourage you in the future, if you have the opportunity, to access that either here in South Burlington or at any number of the other readings across the state. I think at the moment there are approximately 40 or 50 plus readings that are done over the course of uh, usually in July, but in other places as well. Um, and so again, I hope that you have the opportunity to access that. So. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna try here um, to have a conversation with all of you. What I've been asked to do is to try to talk a little bit about the issue of race. But before we get into this issue, I do wanna just first start by saying again how grateful I am. I wanna actually invoke and, and really remember a couple of very important people to me. When I was an undergraduate at Boston College, I had the opportunity to take a class titled The History and Development of Racism in the United States of America. At the time, the class was taught by two men named Horace and Paul. Horace at the time was approximately 72 years old and had been teaching the course for over 20 consecutive years, 50 consecutive semesters. It was an amazing commitment to the work. Horace and Paul also happened to be white men. And what they taught me and what they literally taught thousands of undergraduates throughout the time that they taught this course was the history and development of racism in the United States of America. All of the work that I have done over the course of my life, frankly, can be largely attributed to those two men. I have uh, done a lot of learning about my own history. I've done a lot of learning about other people's histories as well. And what I'm gonna to try to do today is to synthesize some of that for you um, in this, again, presentation. But I know that, like many of you here, right, we've all gotten to this point, uh, in large part, to those people who have made indelible marks on our lives, and I just wanna, again, remember them for that. Horace also recently passed away, um, and that was uh, something that obviously hit me quite hard. But hopefully, in work like this, I hope to carry on his legacy of this important work. So as I said, again, this is my name and title. I think it's really important to uh, acknowledge that I really do believe that my purpose in life is to passionately pursue justice to make the world a more equitable place. I've been doing that, um, as Beth said, as primarily a school leader, a school-based leader for the past, uh, gosh, about 12 years now and I'm really excited about uh, becoming a catamount and doing that work at UVM as well. Somebody over the past uh, couple of days has shared with me that Vermont is such a small community that there is no such thing as six degrees of separation here. <laughs> I've already learned over the past 15 or 20 minutes um, all of the different connections that I already have with some of you. For example, my realtor is very good friends with somebody in this room, um, and I'm sure that there are other ones as well. So let's start by just talking a little bit about this whole notion of race. Because to be very honest, it's something that unfortunately, I think, in my opinion at least, few people in this country have actually sat down to think or talk about. It's easy enough to go to the dictionary to figure out what the definition of race is. But there is this paradox that we in this country <coughs> struggle with. On the one hand, right? Race doesn't exist to some people. And on the other, there are these very real outcomes for people who are classified as belonging to or not belonging to a certain race. So how do we come to grips with this paradox? How do we struggle with this seemingly uh, incoherent, I suppose, way of dealing or understanding this world? So, the topic of today, uh, today's lecture here is really what's race got to do with it? This is a question that we not only hear every single day on VPR or on CNN, uh, 
or written in newspaper articles, but through social media. There are people across not only our country, but across the world who are grappling with this question. And on the face of it, it seems so simple. Right? What is race? And yet, for many centuries now, it has confounded us. And again, what I'll try to at least illuminate is how it has impacted us here in this country as well. So before we get there, I do want to take a quick step back and talk a little bit about our approach at least. And by I mean our, the work that I do through the consultancy that I work with. You probably recognize this man. What I want to start to talk a little bit about is this whole notion of intellectual quotient and about this idea that we as human beings, right, have something inside of our brains that allow us to make sense of the world in an intellectual way. I think for many years we've regarded this as one of the best ways for us to make sense of the world in which we live. I think what we've started to do as human beings is better understand that that's not, frankly, good enough. There are other ways to interact with the world, and there are other ways to understand it that are beyond just, again, that of the mind. There's a whole body of research right now that has been developed over the course of the past few decades that has started to talk about this whole notion of emotional quotient or your emotional intelligence. I think all of us can understand what that is. Um, I know, for example, that sometimes if you uh, celebrate Thanksgiving in a very American traditional way and family members maybe from other parts of the country come together after having been apart for a while, you have to learn how to make sure that you break bread with that person in an appropriate way. There is this emotional intelligence that goes into those interactions that allow you to have a great meal and a good time with family. So the intellectual part we know is important. It gets us to a certain place. We're also learning that there is a, an importance to the emotional side of how we interact with and how we, again, uh, understand the world. And what we at CQ Strategies talk a lot about is also our cultural quotient. It's figuring out right, how we can relate to people who might have different cultural beliefs about uh, any number of different things, and how all three of these things, right, the intellectual, the emotional, and the cultural piece come together to help us better understand and interact with the world. Our plan for today, I hope, will be relatively straightforward. What we're doing right now is just going through a brief introduction. Next, what I'll try to do is engage you in a very short activity on a word called bias and to actually experience that to a small degree right here and now with one another. We'll talk about, again, race, its historical origins, as well as some of the impacts of it on our country today. We'll start to talk, and this is gonna be uh, towards the tail end of this particular lecture, about isms, about the ideologies that have impacted us uh, in different ways. And at the end, of course, we'll have a quick, or excuse me, a, uh, not a quick, we'll have a question and answer period <laughs> for all of you as well. So what I'd like to invite you to do right now is there's a short video clip that I'm going to show. Um, typically, I show it twice because sometimes people just need that. Um, but I'll ask you after we watch together once if, again, that second go through is necessary. Um, but what I'd like you to do again is just to obviously watch the clip for the moment and just follow the directions that are in it. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> 
anybody need to see that a second time? <laughs> no. Okay. If, um, if, if you're open to it, would you mind just sharing um, if you saw the moonwalking bear the first time? The second time? Yes. Okay. What's interesting about videos like that is that it truly is easy to miss something that you're not looking for. I'm sure you've come across this before when maybe you've made the decision to purchase an appliance or a car or something along those lines. Right? You start to see that type of car everywhere after you've made the decision, I'm definitely gonna buy that Subaru Outback this year or something along those lines. What's interesting about videos like this is that it really encourages us to think a little bit about, well, what is it that we might be missing that's right in front of our eyes, but it's obviously just something that we're not looking for. And race is very much like this, because it's in front of us at all times. When I walked in the room earlier this afternoon, right, it was present and I walked in here as people started to look at the phenotypic characteristics that make up who I am as an individual. I was, again, making very similar uh, judgments as well. But there is, again, this seeming paradox between what we're supposed to do with that information that makes race such a difficult topic, in many circles at least, to talk about. So I want to ask you just another quick question here, and I'll read this to you. Humans have approximately 30,000 genes. On average, how many genes do you think separate all members of one race from all members of another race? So for example, how many genes separate somebody from the white race? than somebody from the Asian or black or other race. And I'll just give you uh, a couple of kind of options. And if you could just raise your hands and let me know what you think. You don't have to, but if you would be so kind, that would be helpful. So how many people think that there are zero genes that, again, separate all members of one race from all members of another? How many people think that there might be about 10 of these 30,000 genes that separate some from others? How about 50? Okay. Uh, 500? Okay. We could. 10. 10, all right. The fascinating thing about genomic science right now is that we have been able to, as human beings, figure out that there are zero. There are zero characteristics, traits, or genes that distinguish all members of one so-called race from all members of another race. What some people argue is that this is a myth that has become a part of the air that we breathe. That because I look this way, and perhaps you, sir, look that way, that there is something inside of our genes, inside of our very genetic makeup that makes us different. And yet, again, what we'll talk a little bit about a little bit later is that the fact that we are part of the same species is something that is lost behind a very thin layer of epidermis. And the old saying, right, uh, that really, beneath the surface, we're all the same, is very, very much true. And that, again, goes all the way down to the genetic level as well. So one of the things that research has shown us is that it is incredibly important for all of us to just acknowledge that there are some things that are true about the way in which we interact with the world. The video that we showed you earlier was to just illustrate that. Sometimes, if something's right there in front of you, it's easy to miss it. And that's OK, because that is actually what has gotten us to where we are today, those mental shortcuts that allow us to interact and interpret and understand the world. And yet, sometimes, it also is a liability or is a blind spot for us. And if we can acknowledge that and we can pause, the research shows us that outcomes in any number of different areas become very different. And that's, again, what we're going to hope to get to as we get through the rest of this lecture today. I'd like you to take another moment to just pause and think here. And I, I used 
Uh, former President Obama, I, I love this picture of him just because it shows him being very pensive and, and thinking very deeply about something before I hope he acts. And it also has uh, Abraham Lincoln there in the, in the rear. What I'm going to do is going to show you just a series of pictures. And I'll ask you just a few questions to reflect on after I show you those pictures. And what I'd like you to do is just to, to yourselves, uh, think a little bit about what comes to mind as you see these pictures. Okay? Again, just think to yourself what comes to mind when you see these pictures. So I'd like you to think about these questions. Typically when we do this work, we talk a lot about the importance of doing the individual work that's necessary in order to understand not only kind of the outside world, but to understand oneself as well. It's that inner conversation that one needs to have in order to really, again, begin to understand this. So what I'd like you to do, and again, invite you to do, is just to think about these questions in the context of these pictures, those pictures, excuse me, that we just looked at together. How do you define race? And again, not how Webster's or any other right, dictionary does, but how do you right now, given your life experience, your uh, education, et cetera, how do you define race? And there won't be a quiz, so don't worry about that. How many races do you think there are? And what are they? And the third question is, just like you to take a brief look around the room. Who do you think is similar to you biologically or genetically? And it's not a trick question, uh, but just take a brief look around the room. If I had the opportunity to ask each and every one of you to define the word race, my assumption is that I get very different answers from many of you. I assume there might be some that overlap with one another, uh, but again, my assumption is that there will be many different ones. Um, my understanding is also that these lectures uh, don't typically uh, ask for people to kind of um, interact with the lecturer. Um, and I'm wondering if I could kind of be bold here and maybe ask if there was a participant or two that might be open to sharing with the group what their definition of a word like race might be. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. I'll come over to you if that's okay. And maybe I'll repeat what you say if that's okay with you. I just finished a book called Homo Sapiens. Ah. And it, I like the lurking prejudice. That was enough to cure me. Okay. <laughs> and I can recommend it. It's very readable. Um, it's been translated into, I think, 27 that I'm not sure I found it. A lot. Languages. Languages are different. But it's aimed 
Nobody in particular except you should pay attention to it. Okay. Do you know the book? I am actually not familiar with it, no, but I'll have to look it up. You do. Okay. Yeah. And I have, it was a follow-up book called Homo Deus. Okay. It was a short, I would say about 20 watches. Okay. And what would your definition of race be then? There is none. Um, ah. <laughs> species, Homo sapiens, okay. and we have spread variously throughout the world, and we wiped out some other species in the right. process, right. Okay. and we wiped out a lot of wild things, a lot of life okay. in the process, so uh, there's no virtue in being a Homo sapiens. Interesting. And what is your name now? Anne Carlson. Anne. Nice to meet you. So Anne recently read a book titled Homo sapiens. Okay, so Anne recently read a book titled Homo Sapiens, and uh, she highly recommends it. So if you have not heard about it or read it before, she highly recommends that you do so. And one thing that she was talking a little bit about was this whole notion that there is this one race, right, that which is called Homo Sapiens, and over the course of time, there were other species, uh, you might have heard about them before, the Neanderthals or others that uh, really died off, and Homo sapiens, right, the people that we, um, the race, I should say, excuse me, that we belong to is the one that is here right now, okay? Well, that is, is a very helpful definition of race. My assumption is, though, again, that for those of you who might not have read a book like Homo sapiens, that there are other, again, definitions that might come to mind, right? That there, uh, if you go to our census documents, for example, there are different boxes that one will check if you uh, belong to a certain race or don't belong to a certain race. And that is typically, again, how race is understood to be defined. You belong to something because of some reasons. And again, the commonality of being a homo sapien, as Anne was talking about, is something that, again, is not, um, either prioritized or acknowledged in that particular way. The second question is also an interesting one, because Anne, right, and the author posits that there is, right now at least, in our regard, this one race of Homo sapiens. Again, I think that the common uh, prevailing thought is that there are many. And again, how can one not think that, given all of the different ways, right, that other human beings around the world look? I don't look like this individual. How can we right, be very similar biologically or genetically? That's just impossible, right? He's much better looking than I am. <laughs> He's in much better shape than I am. I, I, I wish I had hair like that. Um, there, there's a lot that right, seemingly separates us. So how, again, could we be part of the same race? But again, I think the common kind of prevailing thought is that there are many races, a lot of them right, being very easy to uh, describe or understand based on, again, this, or again, this. And the last question was, again, just to similarly get you to think a little bit about what it is about each of us here in this room that is either similar or different. One thing that I'll touch upon now that I hope to come back to a little bit later is the reality that there is very little that separates us as human beings. We might have different cultural values, a different language that we speak, different ways of doing certain things, but the reality is that we as human beings have very little that separate us. But something has happened over the course of centuries that has made us think very differently about one another, and it's had some very real impacts on, especially in our country, uh, one particular group of people. So just to start to acknowledge some of the history here, the English word for race turns up for the first time in a poem by William Dunbar in the year 1508. For those of you who, who might be history buffs, uh, you might remember that it is around this time that people from England were starting to explore the African continent in, in ways that had not been done for a long time. 
the people with the lightest pigment or skin tone in the world were starting to interact more and more with some of the people with the darkest pigment in the world. And the English were frankly astonished. They were dumbfounded by the difference they uh, observed in African people in general. Their dress was different, if they had dress, right? Their manners or mannerisms were different. Their obviously skin tone was very different than theirs. Religion, what religion? At least according to the English. Systems of government were different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they started to try to just make sense of how this was possible. How could we look the way that we look? How could we do things the way that we do things? And how could they look the way that they look? And how could they do things the way they do things? And what I want to also acknowledge is that notions of whiteness and notions of blackness had been well-defined in the English language for some time before that word was used in that poem in 1508. And to be honest, we know this and we know this well today because it is still something that we, I think, can understand very much today. There was this cultural understanding of whiteness as being pure, as being clean, as being angelic. If you look at the use of, again, white in iconography and religion and other places, can we know that right today. There's a reason that in my home, we use a white linen for our Thanksgiving dinner table or our Christmas dinner table, right? There's something about it that connotes pureness or cleanness or something again that is divine. On the other hand, and again, this is before the English started to interact more and more with people from Africa, there was this cultural understanding about blackness. And again, these things have continued and obviously are a part of our culture today as well. The understanding about blackness was that it was somehow right, the opposite of white. It was immoral. Right? Black is associated with dirty right, or even demonic. And so, as the English, right, from what I understand, started to interact more and more with people in Africa, they started to think about, well, what could we use to start to describe this? For us, this seems so different than what we are. You can start to see how, as these races started to be defined as being that of the quote unquote white race, and another group of people being part of the quote unquote black race, how some of these cultural understandings of these two words started to be attributed to other people. And there is amazing literature out there that talks about all of the different ideas that went into why right, some people uh, had darker skin than others. Um, I was born and raised Catholic. I was talking to uh, somebody about that earlier today. And, um, you know, I remember very clearly, right, reading um, the Bible and learning all about, again, um, all of the things that are in that particular holy book. And again, having that text and starting to, again, figure out what it was within that that applied to these other groups of people, right, that didn't believe in that particular religion, again, we can start to see how these understandings get overlaid on other people. I want to fast forward the clock here a little bit. And some of you may uh, be familiar with this um, work. This particular uh, drawing is attributed to a man named Johann Frederick Blumenbach. He was an 18th century physiologist. And he is, uh, frankly, one of many people uh, over the course of human history that have tried to better understand this whole concept or notion of race. But much later than we were just talking about, in 1779, he divided the human species into five races. And as I pull these up, I just want you to think about where you might have seen or heard these ideas before. Again, so in 1779, he divides the human species into five races. 
That says the Mongolian or yellow race. This one is interesting, that last one. So I ask you, how many of these overlap with your thoughts on race? I know for myself, before I took the course that I talked about earlier, this is exactly, well, not exactly, very close to what I had thought about, what I had thought about race. In all of my schooling, um, this was the primary or predominant uh, just understanding of how races were organized, how some of them were biologically destined. And the crazy, right, under, the, the, the crazy thing about this is that these are not new ideas. And what I'll try to do, again, at least orally, is start to also talk a little bit about the context. For those of you, again, who are um, familiar, 1779 was an interesting time in our country in particular, right? Just a few years before we had declared our independence from Great Britain, we were engaged in a war to fight for our independence. And obviously, a few years after uh, this study, uh, we became the United States of America as we know it right now. And during this time again, right, people like Johann Blumenbach were trying to explain the world in this way. And a lot of questions for me have come up over time. Why? What was the purpose of this? Blumenbach argued, based on craniometry, right, the study, literally, of the skull. And I think he uh, had, at the time, dozens of samples from across the world, measuring out the internal capacity of some skulls vis-a-vis -vis other ones. Um, and other, again, scientists tried to use other measures uh, of, of the body in order to define who belonged to certain race and another. But for me, one of the questions was, again, why? Why would we need this? If, for most of human history, right, we had not defined people in this particular way. For sure, we had defined people as believers and non-believers, as barbarians or educated people, right? But what role did this play? And we'll come back to, again, the connection between why these frames are so prevalent and relevant today. But I also want to acknowledge that there was something that had been going on in our world and something that was accelerating to a large part in this part of the world at that time as well. And obviously, that was right, the enslavement of many people, primarily from Africa, for forced labor. And so again, the question is, how does this understanding, how does this division of race allow something like that to happen? And again, there have been many, many books that have been written by scholars that have researched this far more than I have that begin to help people understand how we as human beings could subjugate other human beings. And partially, it's the psychological phenomena of uh, cognitive dissonance that we have been able to convince ourselves that somehow, biologically or genetically, we are different, that we are not on the same level. And because of that, right, I can do something to another person because they're not human. And we hear echoes of that today as well. And part of, again, what I hope to come out of this lecture is for you to, um, if you don't already, right, to really celebrate that common right, humanity that we have with one another and to understand that some of these things right, have been so ingrained in our culture and in our history, but they don't have to be that way. That we can do something about it in our daily interactions, perhaps in our families, 
for our workplaces as well. So I want to ask you also to think a little bit about the work that Blumenbach and many other uh, scholars at the time did in order to create this whole framework of race. And I'd like you to start to think a little bit about the different institutions that existed at the time, that still exist today, and how those individual institutions may have been influenced by these ideas. And I'll, I'll use some examples as we go through this to try to illustrate that as best as possible. So first of all, the education institution. If I, for example, as an English person with power at the time, was able to design the curriculum that students were having access to, and I could write the textbooks or the books or the lectures right, that were given at the time, right, whose ideas were the ones that were placed above others? And which ones are the ones that were provided as the reality of the situation or the kind of natural order of things and whose, again, narratives were not? If we look at an institution like the criminal justice system, right, how does, again, a framework like the one that I just shared with you influence the decisions that might be made in terms of adjudicating uh, court cases on simple things like theft or murder or other types of things. And again, what I'd like to encourage you to do is think about the impact of these institutions, again, not only over a course of years, but really, again, over centuries. In our government, who was able to hold places of government, who was able to run for things like parliament or the presidency or Congress, and who, again, wasn't? How did it play out in housing? Who was able to own land? Who was able to rent or have to work right, land for other people? In business, in the media today, whose portrayals, again, are shown in a certain way and whose portrayals are shown in another way? How did that play out in the military? Right? Who is even able to wear the cloth of our nation? And in what types of jobs? And again, I go through all of these different institutions to get you to think a little bit about how each of them may have been influenced by this understanding of race. And this is the last one that we'll talk about. Each one of these institutions, um, if I had the opportunity to kind of project them up here right now in, in three dimensions for you, I would, because what I've learned is that each one of these institutions have worked together in what some people consider to be a systemic web of racism, where each of the different institutions right, have worked with one another in different ways in order to create the society in which we live in right now. And we can connect any two or three or all of them together to see how they might have played out with one another for individual people and in our country's context for entire groups of people as well who have been defined by their, again, so-called race. About 50 years ago, last week, some of you may remember that there was a very famous presidential commission that was put together that resulted in a report called the Kerner Commission. And in that report, they tried to talk about all of the things that in 1968 were attributing to the assassinations of people like Robert Kennedy and Dr. King and others, as well as all of the riots that were going on across the country. And they came to right, the conclusion that we were in a dangerous place, that we were a country that was divided. Along the race of, right, along, excuse me, um, this idea of race. And that if we were not careful, we would have two countries over time. One, again, white with access to certain things and one black without. 
And thankfully, I think to um, make sure that we can acknowledge that 50 years later today, we have seen a lot of progress in a, in a number of different areas from the level or the rate at which African-American children graduate from high school and access post-secondary options to things like outcomes within our healthcare system, et cetera. But I'll just share with you three statistics that in the follow-up report that was, again, just published, I believe, last week, uh, 50 years after the Kerner Commission, some of these things are still true, right? That today, black workers still make only 82.5 cents on every dollar earned by white workers. And while that might seem you know, not too bad, only a little bit off, right? we have to ask ourselves what that, again, means for that individual person, their family, uh, et cetera. Today, African Americans are 2.5 times as likely to be in poverty as whites. And today, the median white family has almost 10 times as much wealth as the median black family. And I highlight these three statistics because they show that today, right, race still has a very real impact on how certain people live in our country and how others live as well. And I know that I personally have a unique role to play in this conversation. Um, I didn't share with you earlier that uh, I grew up in Manhattan and my parents both immigrated here from South Korea when they were quite young. My mother was just 19 and my father uh, was about 23. And they came here right, with the promise that they would be able to live the American dream and to a very large degree they were able to. And they provided me access to um, quote unquote elite educational institutions. And the privilege that I have, having been able to access those types of schools and to have had the privilege of being able to serve the communities that I've served, is that I know that I need to illuminate this part of our nation's history because these systems of inequality have perpetuated themselves for centuries. And that if I personally don't choose to do something about them, the likelihood that in 50 years when we write a follow-up to the follow-up of the Kerner Commission report, right, that these numbers may not look very different. There's a, a biological anthropologist named Alan Goodman that talked about race is not based on biology, just like I hope I've been able to argue, but that race is rather an idea that we ascribe to biology. And again, for me, there is a clear purpose to why race has been something that we've ascribed to biology, because it has allowed us as human beings, some of us at least, to be able to justify our actions towards other human beings. But hopefully, again, I have sufficiently at least tried to challenge you to acknowledge that history, but to also think a little bit differently. I know that my time here is starting to wind down, but I do want to go through, if that's okay, Beth, one um, additional piece. And this, for me, is extremely critical to go over as well. Many times when I do these types of talks or when I talk to especially young people, they always ask, what is racism? Like, how do you define racism? And I want to bring this up here because it goes right along with our conversation about race, but it also acknowledges something else that we've been kind of touching upon as well. And Horace and Paul taught me this very simple formula to understand racism, and I'd like to share that with you this afternoon. Racism equals prejudice plus power. And to take that just one small step forward, racism here and in any other country in this world, right, equals racial prejudice plus systemic power. And racial prejudice, if we had the time, right, are those things that we um, identify as stereotypes that we might, again, have as biases of other people. So for example, uh, some people when they first meet me always expect me to speak with an accent, things of that nature, right? Systemic power is something that we were talking about before, 
It's how those institutions that we walked through earlier, right, how they interplayed with one another that creates the system that we are in right now. And the interesting thing about this particular formula is that it actually can be used to understand a lot of different isms in our country and, again, around the world as well. And I'll just offer a few of those to you right now. The same kind of understanding of racism can be used to understand sexism, right? Sexual prejudice plus systemic power. As I alluded to earlier, who had the right to vote in our country, right? Asex did for many, many, many years. Asex did not until just, right, uh, about 100 years ago. And that systemic power, the power of the vote, the power of the ballot, et cetera, was able to keep some things the way that some people wanted them to be kept. That again, same right frame could be used for heterosexism, heterosexual prejudice plus systemic power. Very similar, again, systems that are used in order to um, create right, our society in the way that it is. And I'll just use one last example, classism, right, class prejudice plus systemic power. And again, any number of other isms can be used in this similar way. But what's critically important to understand is that racial or sexual or, in this case, class prejudice right, are insufficient to create the inequities that we in our country are experiencing without the systemic power to do so. And part of this work is to really make sure that we figure out ways to address right, these systemic systems. So as I said earlier, what I'd love for you all to do is to imagine a world with me. As I mentioned, I grew up in Manhattan and I uh, grew up on the Upper West Side just a few um, minutes away from this particular um, image. And, and many of you may know about this uh, from having enjoyed John Lennon's music. But I'd like you to imagine a world where, yes, to a certain degree, we can rid ourselves of the notion that there are so-called different races, that the phenotypic, again, differences between me and other people here in this room are real, but they're not so different that I, for example, am either um, subhuman, right, or not human enough to be able to live in brother or sisterhood, right, with all of you. And for a long part of our history, this has actually been a pretty novel idea. And so, again, I, I challenge you to imagine a world with me where that wouldn't right, be the case. So I want to uh, express my gratitude here again for the opportunity to hopefully just illuminate a little bit of the history behind the word race, of some of the current uh, implications of that system or that frame uh, that has, again, played itself out in our country. There's a whole lot more that I could go into, um, but I'll obviously leave it here so that we have sufficient time for questions and answers as well. Well, thank you for your talk. And uh, what do you have a definition of race as a working definition? A working definition? You know, actually, um, I'm glad that Anne said what she said about it. Um, I think that there are many races on the planet uh, in the sense that um, there are many species. Uh, however, when I think about race in the context of homo sapiens or human beings, um, my working definition is that, that there is one right, human race that I belong to and that others belong to as well. Uh, there may be a time when there are other races that will come about, but um, as of right now, there is just that one. And so um, I wish there was a kind of a more succinct definition, but that is the way um, 
that I, again, think about race. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, hello. Um, I, well, I just uh, initially want to say that I'm very grateful that UVM has you. I think you'll be a real gift to UVM. Um, but my, what is sort of um, the question that has risen in my mind in, in listening to you, Paul, uh, is that I would, I was going to say, oh, race is a social construct. You know, just that's a little facile. Yeah. Um, but because it, it sounded like in feminism, uh, they talk about the lure of the androgyne. You know, we're all the same. Right. But not giving time for uh, female, you know, strengths and and values to uh, have sufficient time in our culture. So, how do I like? Sometimes when I uh, fill out uh, a form, I'll just I won't I won't even put down race, you know, yeah. or I'll put down social construct. Right. Uh, so how do you deal with that? I mean, I mean, obviously, um, there are certain real contributions of different cultures that yes. happen to be different colors. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, one of the interesting ways, and my assumption is that some of you in this room have had to do this as well, but um, I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old at home. My son is seven and, and my daughter is three. And I've, I've tried, <laughs> excuse me, my best to try to explain to uh, at least my son first um, this whole understanding of race, and he doesn't get it, right? And I honestly think that most human beings, when they are that age, don't either. They're like, what, what difference is there? And I, I had to try to use a silly example. And I said, well, why do we call this a chair? And he was like, I don't know, like, because somebody said that we're going to call this a chair. And I said, yeah, kind of, right? Um, what I want to say also to what you were just asking about is that there are some times when uh, I do fill out those forms and I, you know, in a pithy way or in a kind of silly way, I write human as opposed to whatever it might be. Um, but I've also learned how to play the game and I've been taught how to play the game, so to speak, so that I know that I have to exist within the current structures that we have in our society in order to access certain things. Um, and so I play that game and I play it, I think, fairly well. Because I know that there will be doors that will be closed on me and on my family if I don't. And so I choose, again, when I fill out the census or I have to apply for a passport, I fill out the information as I'm asked to fill it out. But I also do so with the truth that I understand that these are, as you just said, social constructs that, again, humans have created and have kept and perpetuated for, again, very specific reasons. Um, and so there's an acknowledgement of that, but then there's the, also the work that goes on in my professional life that hopefully will start to um, think of other ways of organizing our world or acknowledging right, those differences as well. Thank you. What is your take on uh, the Black Lives Movement and then the kind of counter reaction, well, all lives matter? It is not a relevant question <laughs> at all. So um, if you are watching the news, if you are listening to the radio, both here locally and uh, internationally as well, over the past few years, the Black Lives Matter movement has uh, gained a significant amount of momentum. I think for me personally, what people are trying to do when they talk about Black Lives Matter is actually to invoke a lot of the history that I try to again touch upon very briefly here. Is that for again centuries now, uh, much of the quote unquote civilized world has considered black people or those again with dark pigment from the continent of Africa as something other than human. And that, again, construct has made the reality 
of those peoples' existence on this planet as human beings very difficult. And there are obviously countless stories uh, of enslavement, of, of people who, who quite literally would jump off of boats as they were being transported from Africa to other parts of the world because they would have preferred death to bondage. And I think that, again, the Black Lives Matter movement is trying to acknowledge that history, but to shine a light on the current uh, lived experiences, in particular of black people, here in this country and elsewhere in the world. And so what I think, unfortunately, is, um, is, is done in our media and in other places as well, is it, it simplifies that to say, well, they only care about black people and put them above others, but what about everybody else? And I think that for me personally, that obviously misses the point. Um, again, I'm obviously not somebody who identifies as black, but I understand, especially in this country, the, the reality of those people, um, and again, all of the uh, outcomes as well. So um, I do believe, right, um, that all lives matter in the sense that we, right, as human beings, I think all have uh, the right to be alive and the right to uh, be human beings in the fullest way possible. Um, but I also, again, when I hear Black Lives Matter, um, what I'm hearing is the echoes of people who, um, frankly, for, for much of the past almost five centuries, have not had the voice to be able to express um, how they, again, have been denied their humanity. So I hope that answers your question as well. I think you call them systems in your pitch, education, healthcare. Um, is there a priority list of where you say we need to work? So um, just one small clarification. Criminal justice is right. what I. So one small clarification that I'd just like to make is that those um, are, uh, at least in my experience, considered institutions. And again, we obviously are, are literally in one at the moment, um, or at least a representation of one part of that institution. But there are many other, again, institutions. The systemic piece is the way in which those institutions interact with one another. And in other work that I do, uh, we might take a case study of an individual who might, for example, uh, move to a new part of the country and have to access right, different uh, institutions within that system. So, for example, uh, when I first moved here to Vermont, I had to go to the DMV to get a new license. Um, I had to work with realtors in order to access homes. I had to think about which schools my children were going to attend, et cetera. And it's how each and every one of those different institutions, right, interplay or interact with one another. That's, um, again, what some people have defined as systemic or the web of systemic racism. Um, you can think of, again, examples, um, you know, 1958, 1959, United States, if you were in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and had to access those same types of institutions, um, how obviously all of those institutions interplayed with one another to result in the way in which Birmingham, Alabama at the time was kind of uh, designed, right, as a segregated uh, city that is. So does that help to answer some of that piece? Um, about a year ago, I went to some presentations down at the Flynn about criminal justice and how it is designed in the 1950s. So it's not up to some of the social needs of today. So I wondered how much uh, is the criminal justice system um, s sort of stifled because of its, because of its um, perhaps racial overtones. Right, right. Um, so I just think that, I guess my short answer to that would be that I would argue that almost every single one of our systems um, still carries uh, pieces of this, this frame. Um, the mental models that we all have in our minds that we use to interact with the world are all embedded within those institutions because that's where we live or that's where we work. Um, 
And so I think what we are seeing, again, in, and we could go through any number of different statistical uh, analyses to see how, um, how our systems are producing outcomes for certain groups of people. Um, and we will see, in our country at least, very clear outcomes for kind of white people writ large. And if you compare them, for example, to black people, you'll see that there are very, very different outcomes. In virtually every, I mean, actually, I don't think that there is any single category that it is not. Um, but that's, again, how I would see right, uh, those types of institutions need to be uh, redesigned to have different outcomes uh, for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very, very much.